much for having me. You know, of course, these are dire and very serious times in terms of what's happening in Ukraine as we do this meeting. Uh, and it's difficult, though, not to think about the athletes who have started to speak out, not just Ukrainian athletes, but at great risk, Russian athletes as well, uh, speaking out for peace. And I would argue that you would not see these athletes speaking out at all if not for the eruption that started in the United States when the Black Lives Matter movement collided with the world of sports. I think that has set off this entire chain of events. And it makes talking about sports right now and talking about the politics of sports very important because of how it's affecting the current moment and because I do think it shows how there is a new generation, a young generation of people who are more demographically diverse and less tolerant of intolerance than any generation in the history of the United States. And they're just simply not going to put up with what other generations were willing to put up with. Well, that being said, let's talk some sports. Um, I love sports. I grew up in New York City in the 1980s as a total sports obsessive. I memorized every statistic. I didn't care a whit about politics, let alone the politics of sports. And then in college, I got more into activism and politics. And my sports love was kind of something that I kept to myself. Never told my activist friends about it, pretended I didn't like sports, pretended it was something I did in private off to the side, uh, something that actually felt a little bit shameful. That probably has a more of a psychological discussion than a political discussion, but it was accompanied by shame. You know, I'm a leftist. What am I doing liking sports? And that idea, though, changed for me pretty dramatically when a guard for the Denver Nuggets named Mahmoud Abdul Raouf uh, made the decision to not come out for the national anthem before games. This was, I believe, in 1996. And when Raouf made this decision, uh, first people didn't even know about it, but then a reporter got wind of it, went into the Denver Nuggets locker room and said, why aren't you coming out for the national anthem? And Raouf said, well, I just don't believe that uh, the anthem and playing that kind of tribute to America is appropriate at a sporting event. And you look at what America is doing throughout the world, it just doesn't feel right. And the reporter said, but don't you realize that that flag is a symbol of freedom and democracy across the globe? And Raouf said, well, it may be a symbol of freedom and democracy to some, but it's a symbol of oppression and tyranny to others. And when Raouf said that, it was like the sporting world, it was turned upside down. And I remember watching an ESPN show about it and I was I was completely transfixed. I was like, whoa, these, these seem like my politics being expressed through sports. I, I just I couldn't comprehend it. And this guy on ESPN said, well, Mahmoud Abdul Raouf must see himself like one of those activist athletes, you know, like Muhammad Ali or Billie Jean King or Tommy Smith or John Carlos. And I mean, my mind was blown, like an activist athlete. What the heck is that? I mean, I thought I knew everything about sports just because I knew statistics and who won, you know, the National League MVP in, you know, 1985. And, 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 but none of that is really worth a damn compared to the incredible ways that these athlete activists or activist athletes have changed the world. And it's worth taking a step and actually understanding why sports is such this incredible, uh, incredibly propulsive, catalytic place for other struggles. Because, you know, it's a, I, to me, even though they try to tell us all the time that sports and politics don't mix, what they're really saying is that sports and a certain kind of politics don't mix. Sports and resistance politics. Because when it comes to the politics of militarism, the politics of nationalism, those politics are, are only too welcome. But even though they try to tell us that sports and politics don't mix, the fact of the matter is that you can't tell the story of the early years of the civil rights movement without talking about Jackie Robinson. You can't talk about the desegregation of the South in the 1960s without talking about the ways that sporting events uh, were actually a center of public pressure to integrate. Uh, you can't talk about the 1960s as a whole without talking about Muhammad Ali. Uh, you can't talk about the women's liberation movement without talking about Billie Jean King. Uh, you can't talk about uh, the, 19, the fires of 1968 without that image of Tommy Smith and John Carlos raising their fists. 
And fast forward to today, I mean, I think that the fight for transgender exclusion in sports is one of the most important fights that we face at that intersection of sports and politics. And this is an issue that must be fought not only in the streets uh, for transgender rights and transgender lives, but also is something that needs to be fought uh, in the sports world itself. So th th these issues are absolutely catalytic from the sports world into the broader society. And it's worth asking why. And why is it that sports has this catalytic effect when, say, you know, I, I think it has a far more catalytic effect than, say, like the politics of Hollywood, for example. And, you know, th there are a lot of reasons for that. And I would argue most foundationally the reason is that from practically the beginning of organized sports in the United States 150 years ago, there was a contradiction baked right into the cake, and I'll call it the myth of inclusion and the reality of exclusion. Because on the one hand, sports started with a ton of propaganda, the way it was billed, the way it was marketed, when it was launched in the 19th century, because it was really launched in the aftermath of the Civil War. So sports presented itself as a business to the country as not something that is just you know fun and games and something you do on the side, but actually, and not just as a big business, which it was rapidly becoming, but actually as a unifying force for the nation and the best possible expression of the United States. This idea that anyone, if they were good enough, would be able to take the field. But on the, you know, and that was the myth of inclusion. You know, this is America, the playing field. But the reality, of exclusion was something very different because of course if you were a woman no sports for you if you were black or brown uh you form your own leagues or you don't play at all so myth of inclusion reality of exclusion but as black and brown folks and indigenous folks and women began in the 19th century to fight for access to sports and again that was immediate with the start of organized sports you had the people who were being excluded fighting for their place on the playing field. They immediately made sports a contested space, a space where athletes demanding access and equity and to level the unlevel playing field. So from the beginning, sports is not just a place for fun and games, a contested political space and this battle and the battle becomes something very intense as, as time goes on because it's the sports is clearly a platform for franchise owners to express their beliefs, often which have revolved around not just the exclusion I talked about, but also patriotism, militarism, and corporate rule. But it also immediately became a like this place for athletes to use that platform to fight for their own political beliefs and ideals and to fight for the people who they grew up with because that's the other thing that's different about sports from a lot of other cultural institutions under capitalism is the way it's d dominated by race and class in terms of the labor that's part of sports and then there's also the thing about like these athletes their careers are so short like in the nfl it's only three and a half years they don't have guaranteed contracts. So when an athlete speaks out, I really do think there's this sense that they're risking something. And so it becomes imbued with a meaning that tragically is only accentuated because of the risk itself, but it is a risk nonetheless. And it's, it's become something very important uh, for people, for other people's courage. I'll never forget, that was something that Julian, Julian Bond said about Muhammad Ali is that he said, you know, we were not going to join the Nation of Islam just because he did, but he made us feel brave. And when he refused to walk that magic walk and enter the, the, the military draft, he made all of us feel brave. And that, I think, is a very important part of struggle. So, of course, I was talking about that you can't imagine uh, Jackie Robinson without the civil rights movement, or you can't, or, or vice versa. You can't imagine the 1960s without Muhammad Ali. And now I'll get to the real point of why I'm speaking to you today. It's also impossible to imagine the the era of Black Lives Matter without that image of Colin Kaepernick uh, first sitting and then taking that fateful knee. But to understand that, we have to start that even this latest era does not really begin with Colin Kaepernick taking that knee. Um, it begins with horror and it begins with struggle and it begins, I believe, roughly 10 years ago 
to the very moment that we're doing this meeting. And that was the murder of Trayvon Martin by the wannabe police officer, George Zimmerman, who stalked and killed Trayvon in Sanford, Florida. See, after Trayvon was killed, a lot of people forget this, is that there were mass protests throughout Florida, particularly Southern Florida, like high school after high school after high school, walking out of their classes, doing demonstrations, marching down to courthouses because they weren't arresting George Zimmerman. You know, it took a movement just to bring him to trial. And of course, uh, he was found not guilty in, in just old Jim Crow fashion. Now, when these mass protests took place, in Florida, the Miami Heat made the decision led by LeBron James and Dwayne Wade, these two of the most famous players in the NBA, that they were going to pose for a photograph with the entire team wearing hoodies, uh, which was the symbol of solidarity with Trayvon Martin's family in the fight for justice uh, in his 16 year old name. Uh, so when they posed with those hoodies it, in 2012, this really was the first viral sports politics photograph. Uh, the first photograph to hit this burgeoning social media, and it was still burgeoning <laughs> 10 years ago. Uh, and it was able to ex explode across the internet and have a real impact. And that had a huge influence on this current political period that people saw, athletes saw, that social media could be used uh, as a way to go around the traditional, very conservative, overwhelmingly white sports media uh, and actually speak directly to the people themselves about this issue of police violence. So that's really where it begins. And then, of course, you have the killing of Michael Brown. You have athletes uh, for, um, for the, the then St. Louis Rams. St. Louis, of course, being very close to Ferguson, Missouri, uh, walking out with their hands up and the hands up, don't shoot gesture during an NFL game. And people don't know that while that was happening, uh, activists in the crowd unfurled a huge banner that said black lives must matter on and off the field. Uh, and so you have this whole tumult of things. And then it reached a, an even higher pitch in the summer of 2016. Uh, that was when uh, Alton Sterling and Philando Castile were both killed by police, if you remember, and uh, the killings were caught on video. And so they were replayed over and over again. There was a ton of protest that summer. A ton of athletes spoke out. The people who were really leading the way were the athletes of the WNBA, uh, who were brilliant activist athletes and have continued to be so uh, to this day. But it was really that summer of 2016 where uh, the WNBA athletes, they, they came out, they protested during the anthem that summer. And, you know, they wore black shirts. They uh, held, they locked, interlocked arms. The Minnesota Lynx, even, I thought this was a very interesting protest stra strategy, uh, decided that they were not going to speak uh, to the press unless it was about uh, the police killings and about the politics of of black liberation. And these were, were black athletes, white athletes. And so when the press would ask them about how the game went, uh, they just, they wouldn't say anything. They would be in stone silence. And then when uh, they asked about politics, they were happy to oblige. Uh, so that's what was happening in the general world. And then August of 2016 hits. And there's a preseason game uh, with the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, no, no, it was, not really watched. The 49ers looked like they were going to be terrible that year. And their uh, quarterback, Colin Kaepernick, wasn't even starting this particular game. And it was looked like he wasn't even going to start that season, coming off a couple of injury plague campaigns just after leading the 49ers uh, to the Super Bowl. So Kaepernick, before the game, sits on the bench during the national anthem behind his teammates. And the only we only have little photographic evidence of, the, of what would become this historic starting point because no one knew it was going to be a big deal. Colin Kaepernick put out no press release. There was no way people knew that this was going to happen. If you had asked me that summer, as all these athletes were speaking out and the WNBA was doing all this activism, if you had asked me to list the 20 athletes who I thought would become the next light, night lightning rod at that intersection of sports, politics, anti-racism, anti-police violence, I wouldn't have put Colin Kaepernick on that list. Uh, I would not have thought it would have been him. And he might not have thought it was going to be him. He sat on that bench uh, very much at, 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 because he was frustrated and angry about the killings that had taken place. 
And that could have been a one week thing that just happened and no one would have noticed except one reporter named Steve Weish uh, made a beeline for Kaepernick. And Steve Weish was somebody, oh, I, I know Steve Weish, he, he's very savvy about social movements. And when he saw Kaepernick sitting during the anthem, he made a beeline to him and said, hey, is this political? Or were you just like doing the tape on your ankles? Like what was going on? And that's when Colin Kaepernick just, he went off. And he said, I'm not going to sit around and watch uh, police get away with murder. And it was such a firestorm that that caused. And the right wing picked it up so quickly. And they said, you know, led by Donald Trump, who's running for president. Remember, this is August of 2016. And Donald Trump, would, who has this ability at, uh, at division and demonization, uh, push this forward that Colin Kaepernick would basically be the boogeyman uh, for his campaign. And it's not like, and then Colin Kaepernick wasn't exactly getting a, a full-throated defense from uh, the Democratic Party at this time either, uh, worried that people would think they'd be not just anti-police, but as the right wing was saying, anti-military, because he was protesting during the anthem, that he was against the troops. So, Colin Kaepernick realized he had to do something about the perception of this, so he spoke to another uh, NFL player, a former player named Nate Boyer, who had also served in the Green Berets. And he said, look, I don't want this to look anti-military. I don't want them to be able to say this, so what should I do? And Boyer said to him, well, why don't you try taking a knee because then people will see it as a respectful gesture while at the same time you're registering your dissent. And I think this goes down as one of the great uh, mistaken calculations in the history of, of activism and struggle is, is that they really thought, they thought this, you know, that taking a knee would be something that would calm down the right wing and people would understand that this is a legitimate protest, you know, police violence is bad, can't we all agree on that? And perhaps we can have a better conversation. And of course, I think what they learned is that if people don't want to hear your message, they're not going to care how much the messenger is dressed up and doing something respectful. I mean, at this time, you know, the Trump is right. I mean, they had the bone between their teeth and they were not going to let go. And I think they were also, though, very scared because that gesture of taking a knee, I think all of us, and I have members of my family who are across the political spectrum, and I'll remember when Colin first took that knee, all of us intuited that this was a big deal that this was a gesture that was very powerful, that to take a knee during the anthem was something that would really register that, you know, there is a gap between what this country promises and what it actually delivers. And that that is a very powerful message indeed. Uh, but I think it's also worth asking the question like, okay, so Colin Kaepernick took a knee, uh, it really pissed off the NFL owners, eventually it cost Colin Kaepernick his career. But why are we still talking about it in 2022? Why did it have a particular resonance that's you know lasted today, and I think is going to last another as as long as there's a social just as long as there where there's social injustice, uh, this gesture, this taking a knee will remain. Um, and I mean, although we'll see who's writing the history books, but um, at least at the level of an underground current, this will never be forgotten. And why is that? Why did it have such resonance? And I think first and most obviously, like the reason why Colin Kaepernick taking a knee was so cataclysmic uh, was that there was a movement in the streets willing to support and connect with him. Um, but it's really more than that. I mean, I think the National Football League is the closest thing we have to a monoculture in this country. You know, the closest thing to a national religion, the closest thing to a language. I mean, here's a statistic. That, that kind of blew my mind that I read recently. Of the top 100 watch television shows in 2021 in the United States, 75 of them were NFL games. And there's no other sporting event in the other 25. I mean, think about that for a second. Like watching of sports has dim actually diminished across the board over the last generation, particularly among young people who can, you know, are, are more likely to want to go on, you know, Instagram or, or Snapchat or whatever it is, than sit down for an evening and watch a three hour sporting event. 
that's fragmented the audience for baseball, basketball, hockey. I mean, name the sport and the audience is fragmented in the last generation, except for the National Football League. I mean, it is the one, I think it's the last sport that we have that's not regional um, in terms of its, of, its, uh, of its pull. And it's fun, part of that is kind of funny given how much the Trump and the right wing have spent saying that the NFL is not fun anymore because not enough uh, young black men are getting decapitated with hits across the middle. Uh, that, that actually is one of their arguments. Um, and also because it's this festering uh, left wing, you know, out of of goo which is also kind of a bizarre statement when you consider that the the owners of the national football league effectively bankrolled donald trump which is also an interesting story because donald trump tried to buy the buffalo bills once and they didn't want donald trump in their club because they thought he was too sleazy and too corrupt and it's i always found that interesting that they thought donald trump uh wasn't good enough for the nfl but was good enough to be president um but Another reason why I think Colin Kaepernick in the in, in, like because it's the National Football League, because it's a monoculture, uh, the another reason why I think it was so powerful was that he was taking on the hyper patriotism of the NFL and really turning it on its head. I mean, since 9-11, uh, the league had basically become an arm of the Pentagon, basically in its support for our forever wars. And he was thumbing his nose at that, he, whether that wasn't done intentionally or not. He was thumbing his nose at the hyper patriotism of the National Football League by using the anthem space to protest righteously. Uh, he was also thumbing his nose at the labor and racial discipline that is an utter prerequisite for the political economy of the NFL. I mean, this is an authoritarian league that was really up overturned, upturned because he was exposing the racial contradictions of those who play and those who work. I mean, I've always thought that Colin Kaepernick's great sin in the eyes of NFL ownership was not just that he used what they perceived to be their platform as a place to protest on this issue that they uh, find abhorrent that anybody would dare say anything about police brutality, but also because he just stepped out of line. And this is a highly autocratic sport. And so for him to do that, and for him to do that as a quarterback, had just this incredible cultural ripple. But I would argue that the greatest contribution by Kaepernick to the broader struggle is that this gesture of taking a knee allowed for replication. And that's what my book is about, um, The Kaepernick Effect. It's a book about Colin Kaepernick's uh, influence, but it's not really about Colin Kaepernick at all. Like I interviewed dozens and dozens of dozens of young athletes from across the country who took a knee and I wrote about the uh, backlash that they received and how they managed uh, their coaches, how they managed their teammates, how they managed their community. And I mean, I, I gotta tell you, I think it, I, I learned something from speaking to them. It changed me to speak to all these young people and to learn about what they were doing. Now, I wanna tell you a little bit about what I learned. Um, I learned, first of all, that these young activist athletes didn't just do it because Kaepernick did it. They were not copycats following a trend. Uh, they did it because there had been police violence in their own communities or in some cases, their own families. Um, they also, when I would speak to them about Colin Kaepernick and, is, and it, was he an influence for them, they would say, yeah, he was an influence, but far more often they said that the actual influence was the generational trauma of being very young and living through the 2012 killing of Trayvon Martin. Uh, it's no exaggeration to say that when when they spoke about Trayvon Martin and being, say, 9, 10, 11 years old when he was killed and how it affected their lives, they sound like the civil rights veterans and legends who speak about how it affected them uh, to have Emmett Till murdered. Uh, that same kind of effect where they would carry those scars forward with them from 2012. And when they saw Kaepernick taking his knee, they saw someone who provided a language for protest and dissent. And that is Colin Kaepernick's great gift to the struggle is that he, be that he bequeathed is this gesture of taking a knee during the anthem itself. Now, Kaepernick also demonstrated that the space of the athletic field could be a place that could be claimed for community protest. And that's what these young people did. And it's interesting, like our cities and small towns in this country have been hollowed out by neoliberalism. There's a war against public space 
Uh, there's a war against the unhoused. And the athletic field is really one of the last community spaces where people gather. So, and nature abhors a vacuum. So the idea that it would become, I mean, it's kind of shocking when you think about it, like the football field is the site of dissent. Uh, I know when I, where I was growing up, you wouldn't exactly look to the football team uh, as, as a leadership point of struggle. That, that uh, was, was, isn't something we normally think about. But that's really happened in this country over the past five, six years. I mean, not just football either, but in the book, like I write about uh, women athletes, I write about softball players, I write about soccer players, I write about cheerleaders, I write about people in bands and hundreds, if not thousands of young people in this country, athletes took a knee uh, between 2016 and 2019. And it's so interesting because I'm, I'm writing the book and my whole reason for doing it is I really did believe that, uh, that, all, that all these, like I'd written a bunch of sort of one-off stories for the Nation magazine about athletes who'd taken a knee in, in places ranging from Detroit to Beaumont, Texas. And I found all the stories really interesting and I started to see common threads, which I thought was interesting because we're so often told that we live in, you know, red state and blue state America and a place like San Francisco has nothing in common, like a, like a El Paso, Texas or whatever it is. And I'm seeing as, as I'm hearing all these stories, these, these commonalities from region to region, place to place that really transcends these artificial divisions and showed a national thirst uh, for racial justice. And I think a lot of these, so that's why I first was writing it, because I wanted to preserve these stories in kind of a, a Studs Terkel, Howard Zinn kind of way. You know, it's like, let's hear their voices and center their voices, and they'll speak about their struggle and what it meant to them and how it affected their lives. Fine and good. And then the summer of 2020 happens. Then the police murder of George Floyd happens. And then the largest protests in the history of the United States happen. And I don't think we say that enough on the left, quite frankly. I mean, because a lot of people are very down right now for very good reason. But it is worth taking a step back and saying 18 months ago, there were protests in all 50 states. And they were the largest protests ever. And they, they were super multiracial too. Um, in the streets, and they were young, and it was a young generation demanding a reckoning um, on the question of racism and racial justice. I mean, a, a remarkable thing, and um, I, I immediately reached for the phone. The book was just about to go to press, and I called uh, all the people I'd interviewed that made the final cut of the book, and I was like, where are you now? What are you doing? What do you think about what happened to George Floyd? Like, what, what's going on in your life? And they were all either in the streets or organizing people to go in the streets. All these people who, most of them, the first political thing they ever did in their life was taking a knee on a field while wearing a sports uniform. And now they're, in a lot of communities, the backbone of the struggle in 2020. And you know that, that really made me realize that while lots of roads may have led this country to that summer of 2020, one of them runs straight through the athletic fields of this country. And that story really needs to be told and that needs to be recognized. And one, one last point um, about that is that I also think that the backlash that we're seeing right now, the horrific uh, white reactionary backlash um, against the reckoning that people were asking for in 2020, uh, we saw the canary in the coal mine for that in the reaction to a lot of these young people when they took a knee. Because they were taking a knee, people called them divisive, you know? That's a scary word, they, especially if you're 16. You know, they called them divisive, and but they weren't being divisive. What's divisive is racism and police brutality and inequality. That's what's divisive. What these young people were doing were pointing out the divisions that existed. And in some communities, like this one story I have from New Orleans in the book, um, this, this amazing young woman, Alexis Reed, who took a knee, was able to bring her community together and she spoke in front of her entire school about why she did it and it actually led to a greater sense of racial justice and understanding in her community but that was really the exception rather than the rule um and most of the stories i talk about are the people i interviewed they they experienced a terrible backlash and racism and death threats and everything you can imagine just because they were trying to just because they took a knee just because they said there's a problem in our community and we need to talk about it. You know, and I think that was really was the canary in the coal mine 
like all these reactions to this in cities and small towns across the country, like a huge section of this country basically looked at this young generation and said, we don't want to hear what you have to say, you know, and we actually will um, provoke violence upon your person if you try to get us to think about things that we don't want to think about. I mean, and that was happening and it wasn't being reported on really because our country because of media cuts and the rest of it doesn't do local news well at all but in small towns around the country this kind of not just racial reckoning but racial backlash was taking place and now we're seeing it on a national level and if we'd been paying closer attention to what was happening in the sports world during those years i think we would have been more prepared and less surprised for what's taking place right now so that's pretty much all i have to say about this i actually spoke longer than I was instructed to, and I apologize to everybody for that. But it, it, it's a topic that um, I think, you know, we would do well to think about um, as, as even, even in, not even in these dire moments, but especially in these dire moments. Uh, Ralph Nader always liked to say, you better turn on the politics or politics will turn on you. I actually feel that way about sports, is that you have to be aware of what's happening in the sports world or the sports world will turn on you. Thank you.